great. Hey, um, it was great to see how many people are here for the first time, actually. Really, really cool. Myself, this is my fourth UIConf and first time as a speaker, so it feels really special. Glad to be here and uh, talk to you. Uh, I'm not seeing my speaker notes. So, one second, sorry. Much better. Okay. So, over the course of the next 30 minutes, I'd like to build a minimal implementation of reactive programming. It's only a few dozen lines of code, but it covers the core concepts of the paradigm. And that, that should help you uh, build a mental model of reactive programming that you can use while you um, actually use a real implementation, building it in your, your app. So what excites me about reactive programming is the fact that it offers a single solution that you can apply to a wide variety of problems, while with imperative programming you might uh, need to use uh, specific uh, approaches depending on, on the, the, the context. So when I say single solution, I, I don't mean a simple solution, or it can take some time to get into. You need to look at your, your, your problem, your app, from a slightly different perspective. So I'd like to start with an analogy, with an example of looking at a thing from a different perspective, and that's with these two photos. Uh, they both um, they look similar, actually, at the at first glance, and they also um, um, describe the same event, namely the last milliseconds of a race in the 2016 Olympics. On the left, you see a regular photo taken with a regular camera, and on the right, you see a photo finish camera. And a photo finish camera is actually an interesting camera because it only takes a picture of one pixel wide, exactly at the finish line. And it takes a lot of pictures, like 10,000 a second. And then it can compose a picture like here on the left by putting all those images side by side. And a good property of a good analogy like this is that I have to explain it maybe a bit more. Uh, I have made an animation where you can see the, 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 the athletes running by, and it takes those frames and composes them into a single picture. So here we are seeing time pass by at a single point in space, while a regular photo is multiple points in space at one point in time. So two perspectives at the same moment. So why am I telling you this, you might wonder. Well, we can draw a parallel with what we do in our Swift code. So if we look at the regular photo, you could compare it to a regular synchronous call where you get to work with your synchronous data, you have an overview of your data, you use it, for example, like an array. And then the photo finish camera is the, the other case where data comes in piece by piece and you want to act on it immediately. You really want to use it as it comes in so you have a, a callback, a callback closure that gets all the athletes whenever they cross the finish line. In both cases, we're actually working with a sequence. One is a, is a regular synchronous sequence. The other one is a sequence of, of closure calls where you get each athlete in. And then at the bottom of the slide, there's the, um, there's the, the array notation in Swift, but somehow, somehow that only allows us to represent synchronous arrays. Well, maybe if you squint your eyes a little bit, you can imagine that every comma in that notation represents an unknown amount of time between the elements, and then you can maybe describe even uh, a more wider variety of sequences. So what I'm trying to argue is that we can see everything as a sequence, like synchronous sequences, asynchronous sequences, maybe even sequences of one, just with one element. Everything is a sequence. And if sequences are all we have, we also need, only need one tool, one API, to work with them. Um, let's, let's have a look and, and, and find out what that looks like. And let's start by looking at an obvious candidate, namely the, uh, the built-in Swift uh, standard library sequence API. And that works great for synchronous, uh, synchronous data. So here we, we call get race result, which is an array. We can prefix, enumerate, map, join, and we get the result of the race out. If we try to do the same thing to the asynchronous case, it gets messy. Like, I don't really want you to understand this. Just see that it's a bit more complicated to understand. Uh, you, need, you need another state variable 
uh, Swift has no built-in way to nicely deal with asynchronous sequences. We did inherit some ways of dealing with asynchronous sequences, though, from Coco and Objective-C. So, for example, uh, with a button, you might do uh, 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 the target action way, where you get this, actually, you get a sequence of taps uh, in, the, in the shape of uh, method calls. Same goes for, for a delegate call, where, where your delegate, perhaps to update the location of the device, uh, gets called with the, with the new, um, new locations as the user moves. And the same goes for, um, uh, for the URL session, where you have a completion block that gets called once, in this case, when the, the response continues. But uh, when the response completes. Uh, but uh, these, these ways are, these, um, uh, these ways of working with data are not as nice as working with synchronous sequences as we can do with the standard library with Swift. And so let's look at why it's so nice to work with these synchronous sequences, and it's because they're really nice to iterate over, and all the other operators are built on top of the fact that you can iterate over that, uh, that sequence. And that's, that's powered by two relevant uh, protocols. The sequence protocol that defines a make iterator function that returns you an iterator, and then the iterator has a next method that you call. You get back the next element until you get nil, which means that the uh, sequence has ended. And this is pretty flexible uh, API, actually. We could try to model an, uh, an infinite uh, sequence here with any iterator. You pass it the, uh, the closure that's get call, that gets called whenever you call, call next. So we return zero and then incremented by one, so zero, one, et cetera. So you can, you can actually for loop over it. Your program will never end, but you can actually work with an, asynch uh, with an infinite list like this. But we could also... Um, prefix the infinite list, and then actually have, an, uh, have a, a, a program that, that stops after printing 0, 1, and 2. And we could even map over it. We have to make it lazy, though, otherwise map will first try to transform the infinite sequence, which it will never finish. But you can map over an, uh, over an array, over an infinite sequence, and, and print uh, whether each value is odd or not. So what about asynchronous sequences? How can we apply these APIs to use asynchronous sequences and work with data as it comes in? Well, that turns out not to be that easy, or actually not to be very practical. So in this, this is a bit of pseudocode because I didn't want to make it compile. Um, as, so, so it can happen that, that somebody calls next on the iterator, but there's no value available. So you would have to wait with the semaphore, for example. And then when a new value comes in, you, you, uh, you signal the thread to continue. But that would actually lead to a, a for loop that might be blocking, which is uh, kind of silly to think of. So it, it is a limitation of the iterator protocol that the consumer decides the timing of, the next, of when the next function will get called. And there's no way for the iterator to say, I don't have a value for you now, come back later. When is later? So to solve this, we need to kind of reverse this API. And instead of having an iterator, we're going to use an, an observer. That's the terminology used by, uh, uh, in, in the reactive programming, at least if you use the Rx implementation. So you have an observer and that has a next function that receives the element. So now something can call the observer whenever a new value comes in. We can actually simplify this a little bit and just define observer as a closure that, that takes an element. So with the, the, the standard library, we have an iterator and a sequence. And now, uh, in an attempt to, to work with asynchronous data, we have an observer. And we also need a replacing, replacement for sequence, and that's, that's called the observable. That's the thing that you can observe as an observer. So let, let's try that. Uh, so we, we want to su support both synchronous and asynchronous data, but let's start with the synchronous case. That's easier. So we create an observable that has an array of values. And whenever an observer subscribes, we just call the observer for each value. So using that, it looks like something like this. So we create an observable with one, two, three. We call subscribe, and the closure will get called three times, printing one, two, and three. So now for the asynchronous case, we actually need to add a bit more code. We can, we can keep track of the observers. 
save them when they subscribe, and then when somebody will append a value later, call the observers again to update them about the new uh, value coming in. So that, that will work as well. So we can define again an observable with initial values one, two, and three, subscribe to it, and then later append a value, um, and all four values will get printed. But actually this type is doing two things. So it has this initial data, and then it also supports data coming in later. And I think we can simplify that by getting rid of the initial part uh, and fix it in a different way. So I get rid of some code, and now we can just define an observer, uh, observable like this, and, and after subscribing, we can append values to it, and the observer will be informed. But if we would try to append a value before the, subs uh, the observer subscribes, that value is lost. Nobody will ever know about it. So that's an issue. So we need, we need a way for an observable to react to uh, a subscription, to a new observer uh, subscribing to the observable. We can do that um, in a bit, but it's good to remember this. We, we'll get back to this later. There is a use for this. We'll see later. We can implement it a different way. Uh, but for now, let, let's, let's focus on how we can react to a new, sub, new observer subscribing. So this is, this is the, the observer ball that we will be using uh, for the most, most part of this talk. We add, uh, it, it has a subscription handler that you give when you initiate the observable, and it defines how the observable should react to a new observer. So the subscription handler takes an observer and uh, can do something with it. And then when you subscribe, the new observer is given, is given to the handler. So when using this, it should look something like this. So we can define an, an observable that, uh, that we give a, a sub subscription handler that tells the observer about four values, one, two, three, and four. So you actually define the observable in terms of what an observer will see. And then if we subscribe, it will actually print one, two, three, and four. Because the, the parameter passed to subscribe is the observer, observer closure. That gets passed as OBS in the, uh, in the subscription handler, and it, it's called four times, easy enough. And that looks a lot like how we work with um, regular synchronous data, maybe a bit more complex for now, but uh, even the, the, the signature of for each is more or less the same as the signature of subscribe. But what we've gained is the ability to use, uh, to model an asynchronous sequence, because instead of just uh, passing values one, two, three, and four, we can also pa just pass one value and then uh, wait for a second using Grand Central Dispatch, and then pass a second value. And when we subscribe, first one will be printed immediately, and then one second later, two will be printed as well. We can actually use the observable to model a timer. So we can define a function called timer, give it a delay, and it returns a new observable that whenever an observer subscribes, it will wait for the given amount of time and then tell the observer that the time has passed. So we can call a function timer, subscribe to it, and six minutes later, your soft boiled egg is ready. Um, and we can make more use of this, for example, uh, to model uh, network requests and network operations. So we can define a function called response, where you give it a URL and it, it returns an observable that represents a network request. Um, so whenever a new observer subscribes, it will uh, schedule a data task on the URL session. We're, we're not really handling errors here, uh, but uh, when everything is uh, A-OK, -okay, the observer is informed about the data and the response that comes back. Using it looks something like this. So we can define an observable that defines the response from the UIConf website, like this. And when we subscribe, um, a split second later, because the UIConf website is very fast, uh, print is called. Um, so a lot of power in the synchronous APIs from the standard library comes from the fact that you can have operators on your se sequences and, and compose them, map and filter, etc. You can do the same with observables. So let's, let's try to look at how uh, we can define operators on observable. And let's start with a very simple operator. 
uh, I call that same, which just returns an identical observable. So we return a new observable that for every observer subscribes to the original uh, observable. You can also write it like this, just a small change, where we actually have access to every element as it is forwarded to the new observable. And what we could do is, for example, define an operator called plus one that just increments every value with one. We can make it more generic by defining an operator called map that you give a function that defines how each element should be mapped and then call that function for every element and forward the results to the new observable. And if we use it, it looks something like this. So we define an original observable, one, two, three, and then we define a new observable, O1, that uh, calls plus one, and then map, and we subscribe to that. But it's, it's important to realize that before subscribing, actually nothing has happened, because everything is defined in terms of what the observable, sorry, in terms of what the observer will notice. So as long as we don't subscribe, there's no observer, so nothing will happen. So one, two, and three are not emitted. There's nothing incremented, there's nothing mapped. But as soon as we subscribe, the values are emitted, and plus one is, is executed for each value, and the map evaluation is also invoked for every element. But that also means that if we subscribe twice, everything will happen twice. So now, six elements are incremented and, and, and evaluated and emitted. And with this, it's not a big problem. But if you're doing network requests, you can run into some strange situations where you're doing a lot of network requests. Um, so it's very easy to make that mistake. I, I've made it myself. Um, I have never shipped it into production. Um, um, but <laughs> you believe me, right? Um, but luckily, reactive programming makes it also uh, very easy to share side effects like network requests to make sure that you don't do duplicate requests. So for that, we can, of, of course, define an operator. Let's call it share. Uh, I'll reserve some space for the code that we're going to write. So share will return a new observable. And then for every observer that subscribes to that observable, we want to do something. But actually, we only want to subscribe to the original observable when the first observer registers. So we, we keep track of whether we have, have subscribed to the original observable or not. And if we haven't, we subscribe. And then inside the, the subscription to the original observable, we will forward the, um, the, every, every element to all interested observers. So now we can add the share operator to the UIConf uh, observable. Subscribe twice, and actually just one uh, network request is being executed. So we've seen how we can create observables and subscribe to them and, and, and have operators. But now let's look at how we can, can stop subscribing or indicate that we have had enough. And with, with regular sequences, it's pretty easy. You just break out of a, uh, out of a for loop. But with, uh, with observables, it, it, it makes it a bit harder. And it, 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 but it is very important to, to be able to do that because some observables can take a very long time. If, for example, the UIConf website uh, would be slow or maybe you're on, on uh, hotel Wi-Fi, this, uh, this observable would take uh, maybe 10 seconds. And all that time, your observer is kept into memory. You can see here uh, that your, 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 the, the selected closure is our uh, observer is kept into memory at, uh, eventually by the, uh, the local uh, URL session. So we need a way, we need to update our observable one last time to allow um, subscribers to stop subscribing. And we can do that with something that's called a disposable. And it's just a, a, a simple closure that takes nothing, returns nothing. Um, but we add it as the, result, as the return type of the subscription handler. So the subscription handler will have to return something that we can use to cancel the, uh, the subscription. So and if in, in the subscribe function, when we, uh, when, we, when we call the handler, we also pass along that disposable to the user. So at the subscription handler side, at our network request, it looks something like this. Before we didn't return anything, now we return a closure that when you call it, it will cancel the task. And moments later, your, the, the, the completion handler of the data task will be released, and consequently also the observer. And at the usage side, 
Um, when we call subscribe on, on the UIConf observable, uh, we, we, we store the up disposable so we can call it later when we don't need it anymore. In practice, this would look something like this. For example, in a view, when you bind it to the view model to, to receive updates about the title, you save the disposable, and whenever, you, whenever the view is deinitialized, you stop receiving updates because you call the disposable. So we've seen how we can create uh, observables within this uh, and define their behavior within the subscription handler. But sometimes we want to define the behavior from the outside and emit events um, based on other um, input, maybe from UIKit. So at, at the fringes of your reactive programming world, you will need something else because it's, it's not clear how we can solve this. So this submit button tapped is a, is a selector that's called whenever a UI button is tapped. But how do we send that, uh, that, that into, uh, how do we emit that button tap in an observable? So what we would want to have is something like this. We want to define the observable beforehand and then inside the, uh, the function uh, we, we call a send method to, to indicate that the button has been tapped. But observable actually requires a subscription handler when you initialize it and the send method doesn't exist, so this doesn't compile. But this might remind you of something that we talked about a little while ago. Um, we had this observable that actually stored all observers and then whenever you would append later, it would inform all interested observers. So and in, in reactive programming, that's called a subject. It's a thing that is an observable and an observer at the same time. So it, 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 um, it is a subclass of, of observable, and the send method has the same um, uh, signature as the observable observer. So as but we now can redefine it uh, based on the, the default observable behavior uh, and, and define that the subject responds to a new observer by just storing it in an array, nothing else. Just store it in an array, keep it for later, and then in send, we actually send items to all interested observers. We actually need a bit more code to make this compile. Isn't really interesting, um, but for the record. Uh, so now in the view controller, we can use a, a subject. And then whenever the, the submit button is tapped, we can call the method send, and then somewhere else, we can actually subscribe to that subject and do something with it. For example, what we might want to do is whenever somebody taps a button, uh, he or she wants to um, refresh the data from the uh, UIConf website. So what we could do is um, um, create a new observable that, that represents the response from the, the UIConf website and call it like this. But the problem here is that we now have nested subscriptions and they have the same uh, the same problems or um, complexity uh, that, com that also comes with using nested completion handlers. Uh, there's also no way to cancel this whole thing or to, to manage this, this whole data flow from, from taps to, to network request as a whole and, and be able to, to start and stop with that. So instead, we, we might want to try, uh, instead of subscribing, we might want to try to map. So we want to map every button tap, every void, to uh, an observable representing the, the response from a network request. But then in, in the eventual subscribe, we end up with observables, so not the data from the response, but the observable itself, because map returns observables. So we now have a nested observable. We have an observable of observable data URL response. So we can get rid of that using an operator called flatten. Um, I need to define a protocol uh, to be able to, to do this extension. Um, but let's focus on flatten. So what we want to do is um, whenever a new observer subscribes um, to a new flattened observable, we want to subscribe to the original observable and then subscribe that observer to every inner observable that comes by. So, and the end result is that, that you get an observable that has all the elements of all the inner observables. And we need to add a bit more code to, uh, to make it also disposable. But back to our, our view controller, uh, we can now uh, add the flattened operator and then subscribe to the, the op flattened op observable returned from that operator. And we actually get the data and the response and we can do something with the data. So that's how you can 
compose observables into one. And that's actually the, the last um, concept that I wanted to talk about. We've covered today the observer, the observable, creating operators to be able to compose uh, observables, subscribing and disposing of, of observers, sharing side effects or not sharing side effects. We've covered the subject and uh, lastly, the combining of observables. So, and that all in a few dozen lines of code, but there is a good reason why real reactive programming implementations are not a few uh, dozen lines of code. Actually, they, they do error handling and have special cases for uh, sequences that complete. They have a lot of code involving edge cases around or, or using of, of concurrency and threat safety, and they have a lot more operators. So it makes sense that those are a bit harder to understand and a bit more sophisticated. Um, so and if you're interested, I want to learn more. There's a few resources that I can, uh, uh, can advise. There's an excellent introduction to uh, reactive programming on, uh, on GitHub. There's a workshop um, this Wednesday, but I'm afraid it has, it's sold out. Uh, but if you're going, uh, have fun. Um, and then uh, it's also really, uh, really good to just get started and start using any of the, uh, the, the, the implementations out there like RxSwift, Reactive Swift, React Kit. Read the documentation and try it out. And that's what, what I wanted to say. So thank you.